it's all about rain today. So, yeah. Oh, I love it. Thank you so much. It's so beautiful. Good time. So let's go back to toxic people. So the first question you said, um, you, you mentioned, or sorry, the first point you mentioned was around we can be toxic, anyone can be toxic. And the reality of it is that we all have the ability to be toxic. It's whether or not we uh, become aware of it. So before we judge others, just let's open up our own selves to say, well, we're and this, I had to, had to learn this lesson the hard way, by the way. It's mm. not it's not that, you know, I was born to know this. So I just had to learn it the hard way. When 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 do I display these behaviours and was I aware of it? And were you? At the time? No, I can look back now and go. And it's not toxic as in, oh, my goodness, you're such a bad person. It was that I can close my heart up and if when I'm protecting myself, Okay, mm. and not show the real kind-sided person of me, and I go, no, it's my way or the highway. As an example, yeah, 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 yeah. My time. How? How? how maybe I was busy. Maybe I had had an argument that morning. Maybe I didn't get a promotion that I wanted to. Maybe I was in a bad traffic accident. Whatever it may be, but I go, do we all have the propensity to be toxic at one level or another? Or is it just specifically just certain people? And that, and then the next question is: Are they all? Are these people always toxic? So before we throw that word around, we've got a little bit of self self reflection to do. Ah, uh, so that's all 100%, it is. Hundred percent. I think. I think we. I personally think that we can all be toxic at one any at, you know any stage of our life. But they, they, we do have the ability, and like you said, it, depending on your circumstances too, you can project. You that can project, other absolutely. People, you know, whether whether it's intentional or unintentional. I know, I'm certainly guilty of it. You know, if I've had a bad day at work and, you know, and then or I'm really tired and then I come home and, you know, the dog's thrown up somewhere and I'm cleaning the mess and then my husband comes home and he's had a great day, I'm, I will be the one that's like, why are you so happy? Yeah. Like here am I cleaning dog vomit. Do you know what happened today at work? And then, you know, I and I can recognise that's probably not the right way to interact with someone. Yeah. You and know. so we just need to define that term toxic rather than just saying, oh, well, that person's toxic. Is that based on one moment of time or is it behaviour that's displayed over a long period of time? Mm. So when it becomes behaviour that's displayed over a long period of time from organisation to organisation, relationship to relationship, um, there's manipulation, there's... Uh, passive aggression, there's, and it's continuous, then you can start going, yes, there is toxic behaviour displayed here. Ah, that's the fundamental difference because we can all be toxic at one point or another, right? We can have our moments. We can have our moments. We can have our moments. It's but just- it's when it's continuously and there's, you know, hidden motives that are not so pleasant, that, as you said, manipulation, passive aggressiveness. Aggression. Aggression. It's a, it's a little more than, you know, having a, a hissy fit once in a blue yeah. moon. It's it's a continuous thing. Yeah. Um, that. And it's behaviour that's not addressed and allowed to continue to be become worse and worse and worse and worse because it's never addressed. Why do you think it's not addressed? Is it because people find it difficult to recognise this behaviour or is it because they recognise it but they're too afraid to do anything or to, to, to bring it up to the person that's being toxic? That's a really good question. I think it's a little bit of both, but there's yeah. a number of things. I think there's a number of things. So if we go back to this text, let's go back to the individual first. Okay. Number one, I, I do not believe that people could recognise toxicity within themselves because if they could, they wouldn't be toxic anymore. they change their behaviour. Even manipulative people? Even manipulative. That go in with intent? I don't believe that anyone does anything to harm others on purpose. Really? I don't believe so. Okay. I think most people do the best they can, they can with what they've got under the circumstances that they're in. Okay, interesting. It's a question of do they practice self-awareness? And it is a practice. It's, a, it's something that you have to practice or are they unwilling to look deep within? Okay. When you say practice self-awareness, I'm just going to divert a little bit here mm. just while I've got you. Yeah. What is that? What does self-awareness, practicing self-awareness look like? Yeah, that's a good question again. <laughs> Very good questions. <laughs> um, so do you actively audit your thoughts, your feelings and your actions morning, afternoon and evening? Actively audit. So if I wake up in the morning not feeling the greatest, 
I would then go, what, brushing my teeth, going, what, what's wrong, Maria? Why are you not feeling the greatest? Oh. What's my thought behind this feeling? Okay. What's my thought behind this feeling? And then going into that thought, for example, it could say, it, it could be, and I'm making this up. Let's yeah, go something yeah, yeah. real simple. Oh, God, I'm putting on weight. Okay. That's a thought. Yeah. You repeat that enough time, it becomes a, uh, it becomes a belief, right? It becomes a belief, yeah. And you go, well, do I really want to keep doing that or do I want to look myself in the eyes as I'm brushing my teeth and go, you know what, you've got a very strong body. Yeah. Well, you're okay. You're really or okay. another thought is, oh, God, I've got to get back into work. Yeah. I mean, we all do that. That's a That's thought. That's me daily. <laughs> So repeat that enough time and it becomes a belief. Ask Leighton. I come in and resign every morning. You come in and resign every morning. <laughs> and so you have to and ask And every yourself, morning they reject me. They oh, go, well, no, you know what? Go, 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 go to your corner. Good on them. Good on them. They've got you all. Well, well, they know what to do anyway. <laughs> they, they know what to do. It's toxic behaviour, Leigh, <laughs> telling yes. me to go back in my corner. <laughs> <laughs> or is that bringing you into self-awareness? Yeah. Saying so you're doing it again, Maria. You're yeah. doing it again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, you, want, you want to ask yourself that, that, or that self-audit. It all starts with a self-audit. It starts with wanting to self-audit as well. People often think, oh, God, that's just too much work. You know, um, the quote around 2% of people think, 3% of people think they think, and 95% of people would rather die than think. Oh, wow. That's a good one. Right? Well... <laughs> <laughs> Just ask yourself, would you rather die than think or do you think you're thinking or do you really want to think? And you know you're in true thinking mode when it becomes creative and you're willing to ask yourself those questions and do the self-audit piece. That's where the growth comes from. That's that's very true. I feel like as you get older, you start to uh, unpack some of your thinking processes. I know, I know definitely for me, um, I, I definitely go back and – and I'm not. I don't do this every day. I don't self audit every day. I must admit, I probably need to do that more often. But every now and then, there's usually a trigger, of an event, or something that's happened that's made me really get upset. It's usually in a, on a, in a negative connotation where I've actually had to stop and really think about it and yeah. go, "Why am I actually thinking about this? This is nothing to do with me, or it is something to do with me. How am I going to change it?" Yep. Uh, it is a hard thing to do, but I feel like as you get older, you become better at it. Well, I mean, bit. the mental muscle because it's just a muscle it's, yeah, yeah it's like if you don't go to the gym you're never going to get muscle right yes so if you really want to have that muscle you have to go and train well it's the same with your mind so you just start to train it to think differently you start to train it to self-audit without any expectations to begin with of it being brilliant or fantastic or whatever you deem and define as brilliant and fantastic mm -hmm. and you, all you have to do is just start the practice and then the question becomes, well, do I want to believe my own thoughts? Because most of us have these thoughts that are regurgitated day in, day out, day in, day out. We repeat the same thoughts 95% of the time. That's a scary fact, actually. That yeah. it, that I still can't get my head around that. I mean, I'm convinced I, I, don't make, I have different yeah. thoughts every minute. Well, just test it out in the morning, each morning for the next week or so. Okay. Am I thinking about the same person with the same problems, with the same thing, and then making assumptions behind it, then having a conversation in my head with them before I even have a conversation with them? I do that all the time. Okay, so what are you creating? <laughs> so here's the thing. What are you creating? Because usually that conversation is not going to be one of, I'm going to fix this and it's going to be beautiful. Usually you're having an argument with them already. So by the time you go to them, you've already had the argument and your mind believes it's already had. You're already having the feelings. You're already in a mood. And then you just play it out. Wow. Right, so. <sighs> Getting in control of your thoughts. Do you want to believe your own thoughts? If they're good thoughts, yes. Yeah, okay, so that's good. You made that conscious choice. That's conscious awareness. But do you want to believe the regurgitated ones that you're not even aware of? Or do you want to start auditing them and go, nope, that's not a good one. Nope, we're going to change that one. We don't do that anymore. We, we just channel it and go, what do I want to believe? And then get another thought process to overlay it. We get our minds used to practicing, asking different questions, different thoughts, so that we can have different assumptions, so we can have different feelings, so we can have different outcomes. So just kind of flipping the thought you said earlier, Constantly. you know what, looking in the mirror, oh, I've put, oh, you, you know, I've put on weight or I'm putting on weight. If you flip it and go, actually, I'm stronger now than I've ever been. Yep. You've already, you've put it, you've, you've covered it with a different with a different perspective, therefore your brain will register that. Exactly, exactly. And so then you go, you, you start becoming aware of your own behaviour. 
right? And once you can start becoming aware of your own behaviour, potentially you can start becoming aware of, well, how am I interacting with other people and why am I interacting with other people? That's how you become aware of whether or not my behaviour is toxic. Ah. Now, most people have to go through the first process. You have to wait for people's self-awareness to catch up to them. That's right. But we need to understand as human beings also, well, where does toxicity come from? What's happening to that person? Where does it come from, Reem? Because you know what? Oh, good question. We, I mean, we're all different, right? Your life experiences, my life experience, late and so we all come from, and we've all experienced good, bad, and ugly, right? Um, and our level of toxicity, whether it's uh, introverted to ourselves, because I believe sometimes people are toxic to themselves, um, as and uh, or you know, we we project it on others. Like, where does it come from? Okay, yeah, that's a really good question. Again, by the time it manifests itself as a behaviour, all you're seeing is what's happening. If you imagine iceberg, yeah, all you're seeing is what's happening above the water, which is a tiny, tiny, tiny piece of what's really going on below the water. Mm, mm. Okay, so for me, I look at a person's behaviour. If they're angry, if they're jealous, if they're not cooperating, and I look at my own behaviour as well. So okay. I, first I start with me. That's the yep. most important part. If I'm displaying all of that behaviour, all it means is I'm trying to protect myself under the surface. And it's coming from a place of pure fear. That's all it means. So toxic behaviour equals fear and protection. At a very, very, basic very basic level, level that's yep. all it is. Because you think about it, if you had true faith and you had confidence and you had an open heart underneath the surface, yep. underneath the water, which is a massive part of the iceberg, yep. how would you behave? What would your behaviour look like? Would it be jealousy? If you're really confident within yourself, would it be anger or would it be cooperation in the workplace? Would it be showing love? Would it be, you know, helping someone? Would it be open? Would it yeah, come yeah. with a feeling of, oh, this generosity? Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. the behaviour that you see. So I would be looking at my own behaviour. What does it look like above the surface? Am I treating someone kind or am I trying to be right? What's more important to me? I'm missing your opinion. I want to be right. Okay. So, <laughs> so, I mean, look at that, right? But, okay, is it more important to be right or kind? kind. Let's have now. Let's Kind, 100%. Okay. So kind you look at behind, all the time. So then you go, well, why do I want to be right? Why do I want to be right? Because it pleases my ego. Probably, yeah. Because it makes me feel better because the way I was Gives brought up confidence. is confidence. <laughs> It's vulnerability, it's yeah. this, it's that, it's underneath the surface. And you go, okay, I understand that. So the more you understand yourself, then you start to be able to have a look at other people and go, well, what's happening with them? The worst kind of toxicity that I've seen in a workplace, and I've experienced it myself, is when someone, for example, starts off to be being your best friend, only to use that against you. And then to create havoc in the workplace and become aggressive or passive aggressive or manipulative. All right, explain. Please explain. When you say so someone starts off being your because this is a common thing. Oh my goodness it is. Especially in workplaces that are you know, there's a lot of people going in and out, oh, high corporate, you know, big big companies and organizations. You're new. You you start this job Someone comes up to you, they want to be your friend. You're thinking, great, this is really nice. And all of a sudden they do a three or 180, they turn, mm. right? Yes. Explain to me, like, ex- give us an example with your, with your experience. Like what happened to you that, uh, like, w- when you experienced that in your experience, like, what did you, what did, what, what were you, what were you feeling? Could you, because I'm listening to you going, oh my God, if that happened to me, I'll be like, Beside myself, mm. quite literally, I wouldn't know how to handle. I actually wouldn't know how to handle it. To be to be fair, I wouldn't know what to do. And I have been in situations where I thought someone was a different person to what they turned out to be, and was re- really, really, really disappointed. Um, and and then blame myself for it. Like, why didn't you pick up on that earlier? Right. Well, you might not be able to. Again, it goes back to that Jahari's window. Yeah, you might not be able to pick up on it earlier on. Because you're brand new and they're, the person's only showing you what they want to show you or they even may not know their own behaviour and how it, how it impacts other people's behaviour depending on the experience that they're going through. 
Did this did this person know their behaviour or they may or may not have, but you may never find out. And okay. it doesn't and to a degree, in its simplicity, it's not important to find out. Okay. What's okay. important is to understand where does the behaviour come from and what's happening. So anytime you see behaviour that's not or is a negative, right? Anytime you see people getting angry, um, jealous, manipulative, trying to work against other people, any of that, I just know that that's coming from fear. So how would being on the, being on the receivers end? How do you tackle that? Well, I would I would tackle it very differently to how I tackled it in the past before I knew all of this. And we're talking this is well over fifteen years ago. Yeah, yeah. and and I started looking into well. What could I have done better, understanding where it's coming from? It's been a real journey. Uh, one, I look back at it now quite fondly because I go, thank God I had that experience because it wouldn't have opened up my my eyes to what's out there. I mean, I like for a very, very long time, I had rose-coloured glasses off and I was able to take them off and go, oh, I don't like this. And then I consciously put them back on again to believe in humanity mm-hmm. and people but understand it far better than what it, what it is today. Okay, got you. Oh, yeah. I just understand it a lot better. So back then it was very traumatic and I've experienced it a number. I mean, you cannot go to any organisation without experiencing some form of it. I hear about it all the time. I'm, I'm quite fortunate I haven't. Yeah. Oh, back in my hairdressing days there was, but, you know, the hairdressing was a very toxic world. So you kind of, I think I did what you did. I just went, oh, yeah, that's just who they are and tolerated it and, and, you know, moved, yeah. you know. Um, I didn't have that emotional connection to it, so I just kind of it was all about going to work, do my work, and whatever. I don't care, yeah. sort of thing. But however, um, being in a corporate situation where you're kind of relying on others to do a project together, it's very different. Well, it can you, you, it you can have really to cultivate. impact you. Well, okay, yeah, it can impact you. So I, I would say once this sort of behaviour manifests itself in the in the organisation and the team. You need to always be in check of, well, how's it making you feel? So, for example, if you're waking up in the morning feeling like you're going to throw up because you're going to go to work because you're going to have to put up with this person or if they've sabotaged something that you've done and you know that they've sabotaged it but no one else knows, okay, uh, and it's impacting how your, your work, yeah. there's a there's a few honest conversations to be had. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then you just have to ask yourself, well, what am I going to do with this? Most people, when it comes to toxicity in the workplace and with individuals who are quite strong because it can come up very strong, they won't say anything for a very long time. Yeah. So they just allow that behaviour to continue on and on and on and on. And then they start to go, well, maybe it's just me. People are just scared of bringing it up. I what if it impacts me? What if people think I'm crazy? What, what if, if it I makes it worse? Yeah. So then what we have tried to do in a lot of cases is appease the toxic person, try to be their best friends. Again, it comes back to the Neanderthal stage, you know, our caveman days. We don't want to be rejected. People are so scared of rejection that we try to appease others Isn't that rather than face the conversation and have honest conversations. That's so true. That's so true. In the meantime, we don't try to appease the person who is kind and nice because they're already kind and nice. We're not going to get rejected by them. See, can you see how yes. we've got it? It's warped. We've got it, it the other way we've around. We've got it the other way around. We hurt our loved ones as a result of that. Even outside of the workplace, because our loved ones are kind and they're they're just beautiful, that we can hurt them because we because we can we, because we can and we don't we we're not going to be rejected. The second we feel like we're going to be rejected, this whole mammalian brain gets sort of opened up and it's going, well, if I get rejected, I'm going to be thrown out of the herd. And if I get thrown out of the herd and I'm lonely, I'm going to have a lion come after me and kill me and eat me. We're still thinking in those terms. That's like the caveman terms. It is. It really is, and we don't realize. Very this. primal, isn't it? When you it's think, when you break so when you break it down like that, it is very primal. It's, it's about primal. I need to be part of this group. I don't want to be rejected. Who do I need to appease to stay here? So even we, though they're being yeah, and even though everyone knows it, there's a pe- you're appeasing, appeasing, appeasing until it gets out of control. And what happens is that you build a lot of cancer within that team. Mm. that's when you see people resigning Mm. that's when you see people having sick days going on stress leave there's a number of things or not doing their job or going to different departments 
Interesting. It creates havoc within a workplace. Wow. Right. So the, the easiest thing to do is just to ask people questions. Why are you behaving in this manner? What if you do ask them questions and they give you a bullshit answer? Well, you can only try, right? You can't change other people's behaviour. No. But one thing that you have to do is have a think about, well, what, what, is, what do I stand up for and what are my values? Yeah, yeah. Generally speaking, it's like that bullying in the, in the um, playground. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you stand up, and I'll tell you a really funny story, but if yeah. you stand up to bullies and you're strong, you could turn them into your best friends. Because bullies don't attack other strong people. They only attack weakness, what they deem as weakness. Again, very primeval, very caveman-like. Mm. Okay, so it's that dog-eat-dog dog world. I will attack the strongest, weakest link first and not the strong links. I'll try to befriend the strong links. It's all very primal. Wow. Wow. That's think about that, right? That's, it is, isn't that it? That is fascinating. But you're right. You're right. I mean, I remember being bullied as a kid growing up and I, rem- I remember, um, <laughs> this doesn't happen now, but I remember my, uh, there was this one kid called Jason. Um, I can't remember his surname, thank God, because if he's listening he's probably thinking, oh, I remember that girl. But, yeah, he was he was relentless and it w- I was primary school years and he would just do stupid kid things like, you know, throw sand at me, you know, take my ball away, make me cry, you know. And I'd come home and, you know, and, and I would never do anything. Right, because I was too too afraid of him because he's bigger than me and he was a boy, you know, and um and I'd come home and I'd cry and my dad would say, you know, you've got to, you you you've got to um you gotta stand up to him. I'm like, oh, I can't stand up to him, you don't understand. Anyway, one day, uh, this is a typical um European father. Um, I came home and I can't remember what this kid did, but he, I, I fell off the monkey bars. That's right. I was on the monkey bars. He pushed me off the monkey bars. I came home. I had bleeding knees. Mm. And I was I was too afraid to tell my dad because I thought, now he's going to be on my back, right? So I've come home. He's like, what happened to your knees? And then, of course, I went into the, oh, the that boy pushed me and he said to me, I'm going to give you two choices. Choice number one, you either go to school tomorrow and punch him or you come home and get beaten by me. This would not happen today, right? This is a very <laughs> Balkan <laughs> way, 1980s, right? And this was me, like, oh, my God. And my dad is um, a martial artist, mm. so he did explain to me, you need to stand up to him, you need to show him your teeth because once he sees your teeth, he's going to become small, right? It was that kind of very simple analogy. So the prime evil. Like prime evil. Prim- I shouldn't say prime evil. The, the caveman you called it yeah. was. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. yeah. yeah. And so, of course, you know, a couple of days later I'm back at school and, of course, this kid, you know, started from the classroom throwing his, you know, his um, crusts of Vegemite sandwich at my head and making jokes and, you know, I tried to avoid him, tried to avoid him, tried to avoid him. The day finished and I'm like, oh, okay, you know, I'm just going to go home. So I walked, I was walking home and, of course, he was behind me throwing rocks at me this time. And I just, I stopped and I kicked him. I'm not going to say where, but I kicked him really, really, really hard and ran, ran back home. But I, the, the sense of pr- uh, proudness I felt at the time, the pride I felt at the time, and I came home, I said to my dad, I kicked him and he cried. Then I was too scared to go to school the next day. I did go to school the next day and this kid was sitting so far away from me. Never, so, yeah. never, ever, ever did he come up to me again. In fact, by grade six, we were best friends. So that's exactly right. I mean, because what happens then is that he, you've, you're not displaying the weakness. So they, I'm not. People, pr- and it's not, it's not at a conscious level, but mm. people prey on weakness. Now that's. There's a big difference, though, between being vulnerable, showing vulnerability and weakness. Mm. I just want to make sure we understand that. Yeah, it doesn't yeah, mean yeah. you never show vulnerability. Yeah, yeah. But when you're feeling like the victim and you don't stand up, the bully will become a bigger bully. Well, he did. In my eyes, this kid was, and it's interesting when you were talking about thoughts before, and in my eyes as a, as a little kid, this kid was like this huge, big boy and it was interesting the minute I I kind of flipped it on its head and and retaliated even though I ran um all of a sudden I could see that he was just a kid like me that's it 
That's it. And, and, and I remember that really because I remember thinking, oh, I thought he was so much bigger. And I look back at photographs and I'm like, oh, my God, he's actually not that much bigger than what I thought. Had. Why did I think he was so much bigger than me? He actually wasn't. And it's just a fear inside us. The fear inside us. And so that, I mean, if you translate that experience into the modern day like work, big people's or, you know, work, <laughs> it's exactly the same thing. So it's kind of like you need to address it. When, and when I say be blunt, it's just don't, People don't read in between the lines very well. Don't try to appease a person. Be really open. Like I've had a conversation with, and I was in senior leadership with another senior leader, where I said, look, we don't have to be friends, mm. but we have to respect each other. Mm. You don't have to like me. I don't have to like you, but we have to stop working against each other because at the time she was, I, I knew that she was doing things behind my back. Mm. I went, just enough. Enough of that. You call them out. You call in a nice way. I, yeah, I'm, yeah. In a very nice way. I just the days of me screaming and shouting and all of that and swearing are gone. Not that I haven't done it in the past, but yeah. that's gone. But it's you just call them out with inner confidence from a place of love and integrity. Yeah, and integrity, faith. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And you'll find that people will go, "Oh, okay, that's not the person." To speak to, but we don't do that enough. Leaders are not are too scared. Even if you bring it up to your boss, they might be too worried about bringing it up because this person is very productive and they bring sales in, or or they do a lot. They really, you know, the company really needs them. So we don't want to, you know, we don't want to upset them. So mm. we just let the behaviour go. And the more you let a behaviour go that they may or may not be aware of, mm. the worse it's going to get, and the more impact it's going to have. To a point where I've seen there's been so much toxicity that in a team, a, a company decides, a new manager comes in, they go, well, this has just gone too far too long, so we're going to restructure. We're going to have redundancies, bring new people in. We have to cut the cancer out. Wow. But what if you were to address that right up front? You wouldn't need to cut that cancer out. Yeah. Because you wouldn't, you wouldn't allow it. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's hard, I guess, too, in workplaces as well, because you're dealing with so many different personalities as well. Um, and, you know, and sometimes it is hard to pick up on certain things, um, on toxic behaviours. Um, and then you've, of course, you've got, you know, that whole HR element of it and the whole legal side of it. So you've got to be kind of, I feel like you've got, you've got to tread a little bit you do, carefully. Absolutely. As, a, as an employer, if someone was to come to me and say, hey, I've got to real big problem with X person that works here. They're doing this. I'm not sure if you're aware of it, but I need to tell you, blah, blah, blah. I'd really have to think hard how I would tackle the situation. It wouldn't be a straightforward – I mean, you can have that conversation, but you still have to be mindful, I guess. Well, and I guess that's yeah, – no, the reason is. why I bring this up is I think that's why a lot of people or a lot of leaders let things – yeah, Go. that could be that you could be very, very right about that one. Then there's you, then you have to take it to the next level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you have to say, are we living our values as an organisation, and what values do we uphold? Yeah. So yeah. what happens in more, most organisations is you've got all these values, you know, like all over the wall. wall you know, they're painted all over the wall, wall. We we are honest. We are friendly. Yeah. We are this. <laughs> we are that. And you go, but are you living those values and you're allowing, and it's not about one-off things, it's about that repeated toxic bit, that repeated behaviour that's getting worse and worse and worse and worse and you keep hearing about it, seeing it, and it's creating havoc in the, in the workplace. Are we living our values or are we not? So you address, if you're constantly living your values, you're making people aware of it, that means they have to demonstrate how they're living their values. Yeah. And if you were to demonstrate each day, each employee within your organ organization, how they're living those values, that's where you get self awareness from. Ah, oh, makes sense. Makes sense. So I could come up to you and say, okay, in, in our weekly meetings or whatever it is as a team, could say, well, okay, let's take one value. How are you going to demonstrate it this week? How did you demonstrate it last week? And you get each person to share examples. That's how you get self-awareness because they're actually in the doing mode. Mm. And they're consciously doing. They're consciously doing because it's, it's not, on repeat. Because, yeah, because once you say, okay, you know, say, for example, honesty, how are you honest this week? That's a value. That's a value. Yeah, right. How did you, how were you honest this week? And, you know, Leighton might say, well, I was really honest with the feedback that I gave you about that content that we wrote you know and then what did you do with it yeah yeah and what was the action what was the and what was the outcome and it's interesting because then Leighton knows well this week 
she's going to ask me about this. So everything that he does, sorry, Leighton, to use you as an example, um, everything that he does will come from a place of I've got to make sure that I'm going to be honest. Yes. So, so he has to become aware, actively aware. He, he has to become actively aware. And then you can even, let's just say there is a barrier. Mm. And that could create the, the toxic behaviour. Mm. Then you have to ask, well, what barriers did you, what barriers did you experience this week that couldn't get you or didn't, you weren't able to fulfil what you said you were going to do? Then he'll say, well, this person did that and this person did this and that person did that. Okay, so what's the solution, do you think? What solutions do you have? Or what can, how can I help you remove those barriers? But see the dialogue that you're having now? It's a very different dialogue. It's a, it's a more constructive dialogue, if it's I can say exactly. that. Because you're no, longer, you're no longer shifting the blame because it's easy to turn around, well, I couldn't do that because such and such was in my ear and, you know, you came late and da, da, da. Whereas when you turn around and go, well, okay, what did you do to resolve that problem? It's it's a very it's a much more constructive and how can I support you in solving that problem as opposed to just event session of exactly. blame games. Exactly. And then it gives you the opportunity to listen to the language that's being used to understand whether or not they're playing the victim or are they taking control of the situation. So mm. are they blaming other people or are they taking it within themselves to say, well what what do I well what am I accountable for? Mm. Mm. And so that becomes part of your operating rhythm. Mm. So part of the operating rhythm is how are we going to live our values? What questions do we ask? How do we hold ourselves and each other accountable? And then what questions do we want to ask ourselves when we come to a point where there's barriers or there's problems and what are the solutions behind it? The only reason why people become toxic in the workplace is because they're scared of not getting a promotion. They're not getting recognised for what they do. There's competition within the organisation that's somehow unhealthy competition. Unhealthy competition. There's uh, a fear of like if I don't if I if they don't lose I won't win. So that someone has to, to in order for me to win someone has to lose. That's right. This is the biggest thing that's driving this behaviour. So I have to be the winner because it's coming all from fear. So then the question is, within your operating rhythm, what are you doing to encourage win-win? There's no such thing as for them to lose, I will win, and I've got to be careful not to lose, otherwise they'll win. But then, uh, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> sorry, how do you reward, say for example, you've got, You've got this corporation, um, and 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 uh, you know, and you've got a couple of staff members that really give you grit, right? That stay back, unpaid, that do the work, that work really hard because they they're performing at an optimal. And then you've got those that just come, you know, come at nine o'clock, leave at five o'clock, uh, and don't give you anything else. Like, as much as I believe in that win-win, I also want to reward those that are, are giving me, you know, blood, sweat and tears. No, because, 100%. 100%. Because in my eyes, they're, they're, they're winning for me because they're, they're taking, they're, they're respecting me and they're respecting my corporation or business or organisation or whatever the case may be. And I want to be able to reward them, whether it's, a, you know, a, 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 an award, a monetary award or a, a passive award like lunch or whatever. I, I want them to know that, hey, I'm really grateful for what you're doing. So how do you differentiate that? No, that's that? a good question as well. Because there are there are there are those that and and I've seen it in my own in my own businesses, regardless whether it's property or or, or Casper, uh, or even <laughs> staying alive and rich. You know, um, I, I'm very fortunate. I've got great staff. You know, and I'm not just saying that because Leighton's here. I'm actually really we're, we're a small family, and we are like a family, and everyone is open and honest, and they're they're all privy to say what what what's bugging them and what's not bugging them. And I think we, you know, sometimes we get it right, sometimes we get it wrong. I, you know, I'm the first to put my hand up and go, you know what, I think I stuffed up. You know what, or I or, yeah. or, or apologize and all yeah. the rest of it. And I think that's important. And we're very lucky because we are small. Mm. And there's no room for um, hierarchy here, you know. Um, however, um, I do have sometimes, you know, Leighton might stay back and and do some extra work or someone else will and I want him to know that, hey, you know what, I'm grateful or, or so it's what a have you. I mean where it really becomes very, very important is about the transparency of rewards. Okay. And that's the, the, that's the critical the element. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when I talk about operating with them and when yeah. I say what questions are you asking, it's the accountability piece in the meetings. Let's just say you have daily meetings or weekly meetings. Yep. You ask people, you said you're going to do this. 
Can you demonstrate it? You're living the values. Demonstrate how you're living the values. The reward system is based on the values and demonstration where it's transparent across the organisation. Yeah, 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 got you. Where if people feel like it's not transparent and you cannot demonstrate it, that's where you have a problem. Uh, reward systems are very important, but you have to use it and live it and breathe it according to the values that you see that you've set because the values set the culture. If you've got a poor culture, you go, we've got a poor culture. Well, there's a number of there's only a few reasons for that. Are we living our values? Do, does everyone understand what the values are? Do we know what the goal is? Do we understand our purpose? Do we understand our values? And are we living our values or are they just merely painted on the wall and then we're doing completely different things? So there's no, there's a misalignment. And do we have transparency? Do we hold people accountable? And then do we reward in a trans, very transparent manner so that everyone has the same opportunities? That's, that's super, super important. I think transparency, a transparent reward system where everyone feels like, okay, you know what, if I've done this and, you know, that's fantastic, this is this is my reward for that and living and abiding by our values. Does exactly. Do the employees have to have the same values as the organisation or the employer? Well, you can have – you have a set of values. The best thing you can do, and you're in a really good position if you've got that small group of people, yeah. you can choose your values together, how yeah. you're going to live. Now, how each person demonstrates it could be different because we interpret values differently, mm. but it's through the interpretation that's important. So what does honesty mean to you? What does working collaboration mean to you? Because, again, perception is a huge thing. So you want to get all on the same page. So that means you have to constantly be talking about and working through and demonstrating values until it becomes embedded in our minds in the same way and we're all aligned. That's actually good. I really like that. I'm going to do that. We've we've got a set of values that we li- loosely follow. So that's because they're part of all our personalities. I don't think we could work together if we don't all kind of shit. I guess they're probably more morals than they are values, to be fair. Um, but I've never actually sat down with the group. We've discussed it in terms of uh, the magazine, um, but we've never actually discussed it in a more open forum like you've just suggested. And I think that's super, super important. I think it's very and it's important. a great exercise, regardless of how big or small your business is. It's a, it's a yeah, yeah, it's a must do exercise. So first, you start with the goal. What yeah. do we want to be, right? Yeah. So in five years' time, what's your big, audacious, scary, exciting goal as a team? As a what team. do you want to create together? Because no one, no one, but no one does anything unless they're emotionally connected to it. Mm, that's so true. So you need to get that emotional connection. And you get your team's emotional connection because it's their goal, not your goal. It's a collective goal together. Mm, mm. Then you want to ask yourself, once we reach that goal, how would we be behaving? What values are we going to be aspiring to? Mm. And I'll I'll give you a reason why in a second. I'll Mm -hmm. tell you why in a second. Then you say, right, now we have to live those values today. So as a sales team, let's just say you're just starting up and you need to get revenue in. I would have to ask myself, if I was at my goal and I'm generating what it is that I need to be generating, I'm already, I've already achieved everything that I've achieved, would I be behaving in this manner today that I'm behaving today? And if the answer is no, I would not be doing, I wouldn't be taking that action. I'd only behave in a manner that I would behave at my goal with those values. Okay, elaborate on that. So, say so for example, example, you're using, sa- you're using sales. sales. Okay, let's just say you and I are having a sales conversation and yep. you're really looking into my coaching program. Yep. And you say to me, well, no, Reem, I've only got this amount and um, I only want to work with you in this manner and, you know, and if you don't perform this way and you don't come in and do X, Y, Z, then I don't want to do business with you. But I know that it goes against my values. The question then is, would I take you up as a client even though I'm just starting my business or would I say, look, in this instance, I think we need to find someone else? Mm. Regardless to whether you're going to pay me thousands and thousands of dollars, I need to make the decision based on my set of values at the goal, from the goal. That's You know what? That so is, I'm not going yeah. to lie, steal, 
just take money from you. If I know we're not aligned, if I know you're not my ideal customer, if I know that I can't deliver to you what you want, and if I know that that up front, I can't take your money, I can't take on a contract just because I need it now because it's just going to be very short term and it's going to make you feel bad, it's going to make me feel bad. So what would you do at your goal? That's interesting, not take it on. You wouldn't take it on because you've got plenty of plenty of customers. You've got plenty of revenue. You're doing the right thing by your by your business, by your team. Isn't that interesting? You've just you know what? How many times at the start of businesses that yeah. we've taken on work that we should have said no to, but because you think, oh, okay, I better do this because I need to pay the rent this week, or I need to pay bills, or I need to buy groceries, or whatever. I'm going to do this job, so I'm not going to like it, but I'm going to do it anyway. And then it just ends up being a yeah. A, a, I mean, a in mess. the in the early '90s when I first started my career, geez, it's coming back. I don't. You know, you, <laughs> don't. <laughs> but you don't say, even, I know, I know. Don't oh, even go in there. That late, I, I don't even know. I won't even mention it. Don't but, never mention it. We're but 25 I remember, for the sake of this podcast. I'm yeah, very exactly. wise, yeah, 25 yeah, very, year very wise, very, very wise. <laughs> Eternal, eternally. Eternally yeah. wise. But um, I remember there was a, a saying, it was anything for an order. Yes. Do you remember that? Yes, I do. Anything, And it was used to be a joke. Yes. Anything for an order. And you go, no, it's not anything for an order. That was a classic. It's not anything for an order. It's anything for within the values that I'm going to live by. We've gone, we have really come a long way to understanding ourselves. Because mm. mm. anything for an order creates a whole host of issues. So it includes in the, in, it doesn't even have to be sales, but anything to get the job done. No, it's not. It's not a dog eat dog world. We're not on Wall Street, you know, the, the yeah, movie yeah, yeah. walls. That's not, it's not the boiler room. No, no, no. We we have evolved past that. And let's have a look at, well, what is our purpose? I mean, if you go back to, you know, how everyone goes, well, what's my purpose in life? Why, why was I even born? We only have a sole purpose, and that is to evolve, mm. to grow. To grow and reproduce. So we have to, <laughs> to grow, 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 yeah, grow, grow, grow. Yeah, and yeah. part of it is the reproduction. Yeah. But ev- evolution is what we're here for. 100%. And so now we've evolved to an area where we have to live our values. They're not just words splattered on the walls. You're so right in saying that. I had a conversation last week in, during another podcast with a very prominent businesswoman here in Melbourne and she's got a very successful clothing label. And one of the things she said during her podcast was um, uh, as they were growing their business and they went through this phase where they were trying to be everything to every customer right, going back to what you just said, anything for an order, right, mm. uh, and until it didn't work um, and it was just exhausting. And um, and then, you know, she said we had to go, kind of go back to our value system and go, you know what, what do we like, what is working for us? And it's and, and when they did that, their brand exploded exponentially, Absolutely. right? So there is so much merit and insight on what you're saying and, and it's so easy to, to – to go off off grid with your values sometimes because you do, you know, the carrot does dangle in front of you and you think, oh, you know what, I can do it. It's fine, it's fine, it's fine until it doesn't work. But do you know why that happens? Why? So we've, we're so busy doing, right? We are so busy just doing, 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 doing. Now we call human beings, not human doers for a reason. Yeah. Yet we keep doing, 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 doing. We're so exhausted we stop thinking. 95% of people would rather die than think. I, <laughs> I love that. Three <laughs> percent think they think. Of people would rather and, die than think. Okay, can't even comprehend that. So we keep, and this is where anxiety comes from, depression comes from. We just doing, doing, and we don't stop. I say, just stop. You need to take a step backwards. You need to slow down. You need to think in order to speed it up. You want calmness of mind, speed of action, not speed of mind where it's just racing 20 to 1 and then you're just like in the in the throes of anxiety and then you're just doing, doing, doing and most of the stuff that you're doing is of no value whatsoever. You're just throwing shit on the wall and hope it sticks. That's not what you want to do. Our job is to evolve, correct? So when yes. are we going to learn? We're very slow learners as human beings. But you want to stop. But we think we're fast learners. 
We're very slow learners. Oh my goodness, we're very slow. We we just love to repeat a process, and this is when you know we repeat things constantly, and we never ever learn until it hits us so hard. How many that times you have have, to learn? How many times have I said? I just had that conversation the other day with my husband on one of our works. Like, how many times do I have to make this freaking mistake before it sinks into my head that I shouldn't do this anymore? And the more like. The slower you learn, the more it's going to hit you the next time. You just have to stop. So what you have to do is say, I'm going to take some time out. I'm going to stop. I'm just going to allow myself to think. I'm going to slow down. I have no fear of losing business. I have no fear of, well, what if it doesn't work out? Because I know that once I slow it down, I'm going to get the inspired ideas. I'm going to think about what I want. I'm going to set the values with my team. I'm going to be very, very true to my values. I'm going to demonstrate it and we're going to have an operating rhythm day in, day out, day in, day out that's going to be conducive to aligning ourselves with the goal. You're going to have an operating, this is a thing, you have an operating rhythm. Whether you like it or not, you have it, like we have a set of behaviours. But it, it, it just depends on is how. Is it conducive it or, or is not. it, or are you just letting things just do their own thing? Isn't that interesting? And that's all it is. I mean, it, everything's very simple. It's just a question of are we taking time out? Are we stopping and doing it? Because we do. We get caught up in the rigmarole of life. Yeah. You know, especially, I mean, especially if you've, you know, uh, I mean, I know you've got children and I've got children and you're a mother and, you know, and you've got other responsibilities. You kind of, you do. It's it, it's much easier to be doing, st- not easier actually, It you go into that default of doing stuff all the time. Do you know why we do that? Why? So we don't feel the pain. It goes back to the pain. It goes back to the freaking pain. It goes pain. back to the pain. It goes, we we have to redefine what is pain and what is suffering and pain is okay. It's okay to feel like I didn't do a good job. It's okay to feel like, um, you know, I made a mistake. It's okay that all of that is okay. Stop saying to yourself it's not okay. It is okay. Feel it. It's okay to have a broken heart. It's is a, the problem, Reem, that because we don't feel this pain? Is that our biggest problem? It's because problem? we keep suppressing. We think, oh, my God, that's so painful. I don't want to feel it. So we keep doing because it's so much easier and we keep suppressing. The busier a person is, the more pain that they're in. I'm going to – I'm going to – like I'm putting it out there. There is no psych- – there's no research showing this, but I reckon this is – I've just come to realise if you see someone who's really, really busy, constantly striving, constantly and not willing to stop – it's me. <laughs> it won't pay. Okay. The more, I, I am. My tooth hurts. Your tooth does hurt. <laughs> yeah. But it just means I'm not willing to slow down to find different answers because, well, maybe it's just I feel like it's too hard. That's true. That's true. I must admit, I'm going to, uh, you know, I'm going to call myself out, you know, on this podcast. When something is difficult for me to um, confront, uh, whether it's a work project or whether it's an individual, it doesn't really matter. I do find I like to use the term distractions. I will distract myself with l- layering work upon work yeah, upon work yeah, upon work just because I don't. I haven't figured out a way of how I'm going to tackle it. It's almost buying me time before I figure out a way how I'm going to tackle it. And I do tackle it but I don't tackle it instantaneously. Like I, it, it takes me a while because I need to – I have this saying, I take myself to the boardroom in my mind and I have this like inner dialogue with myself, right, what are you going to do about this? How are you going to tackle it? Well, what's going to happen if you do that? And until I have that meeting within my own mind, I know I sound a bit cuckoo. No, I'm I think not, that's important. I promise. I promise I'm not. But I do. And because then through that filtering process in my own head, I can then go, right, okay, I need to be gentle with this in this approach or no, I need to come down like a ton of bricks yeah. in this approach. It kind of gives me a bit of clarity. But after listening to you, I could probably get to that process a lot faster if I don't layer myself with, with well, work. there's another one. It could very well be how much better a solution can you come up with because what's happening when you're doing, 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 doing is you're going into survival mode. Mm. When you go into the hormones of stress and survival mode, your beautiful creative brain, the prefrontal cortex, cortex tends to shut down and you're operating again from a reptilian brain or a mammalian brain and that's survival mode. There's nothing. Not that they're not good solutions, but imagine if you were to keep your prefrontal cortex open, so slow things right down, how much more creative your new solutions would be. 
Interesting. Because when you're in survival mode and you're using the primitive side of your brains, you're just creating the same thing over and over again. Now, they could be great solutions, yeah. but it's based on the past. You're not creating anything new. To create something new, you have to have this beautiful thinking brain open. And, how, and you open it by slowing You down. have to slow things down, right down. You, you physically, what you do, you know how sometimes you feel really tense? Yeah, physically, yeah. what you do is you have deep breaths. You know, take... I do seven breaths, uh, seven seconds. It's yeah. up to you if you want to make it six or four, depending on each person. But I yeah. go seven seconds in, hold for seven seconds, seven seconds out. out. Right. What happens physiologically, what, so what you're doing is you're opening up all your organs again, your muscles relax, your prefrontal cortex sort of opens up. Now, imagine if you just take some time out and you relax, you open up that creative brain, you allow inspirational thoughts to come to you you don't have to have the solutions you have to have the right questions mm. so if you slow right down and you just sit with it and you go well how am I going to come up with a solution here's the problem what solution is there and you just allow yourself to think I always close my eyes I'm closing my eyes right now yeah no no but right? it's good I just close my eyes and I let it go I allow myself just some time that's when inspirational thoughts come to you which are like so creative but how often do you allow yourself to do that? When you're on holidays. How many times do when people go on holidays, they come back and they're so inspired and so much more creative Absolutely. because they've had that that break away from their desk or their office or their business or what, ha what have you and they've not looked at an email Absolutely. or whatever and it's just been – and you've allowed your mind to – Exactly, Look at, and 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 be entertained by nature or whatever, whatever, or yep. a new country or whatever, the, whatever the case may be. And you, do, I know when I often come back from a holiday, even just a weekend away, um, it's enough to kind of come back refreshed. So then, imagine if you were do, to do that daily. Twenty minutes is all that's needed. Twenty minutes of nice, big, deep breaths, anywhere between three to seven seconds. Inhale, exhale, and just. Well, inhale, hold, exhale. exhale. Ask the, then you ask the question and let it go. Let it go. Just let it go. What's the, what's the answer It'll to come thing? to you. You know, have you ever heard someone say, oh, my God, all the great, all the great inspirational thoughts come to me when I'm in the shower? Yeah, that's me. Okay, well, that's because you I just let go. And I'm out of the shower. So I wasn't thinking about it again. Because that's you let go and then yeah. you go straight back into survival mode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just slow right down. Henry Ford used to do that on a daily basis, 20 minutes a day. Really? Yep. Look, I uh, I go in and out of that. Like sometimes I, I'll meditate and I'll be really good and do it as part of my morning practice. But I must admit, Reem, I, 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 there are moments where I'll, I'll quickly pray and go. Okay. You know? Yeah, no, that's fair and enough because life gets busy, right? Life gets busy. But you only need two things in success, in work places, and we'll get back to the text. So how, how does this all relate to toxic people? But – if – imagine this, right, for a second. If you were to do this consistently mm. – Okay. How different your life How different would it be? How different will your team be? Because you can only – people only learn through demonstration. They're not learning through what you tell them. They learn through demonstration. So then you ask yourself, there's only two things that I need for, for, like for success, to have the right workplace, to write, have the beautiful life. Okay, two things that – predominantly number one right consistency mm. two emotional management emotional management's a big one everything else just falls into that everything else some people go what about resilience emotional management what about the goal consistency what about just either one right consistency so and emotional management the two pinnacles of the of 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 a successful business a successful and not just successful as a business but successful work environment yep. and culture as well you're right emotional management's a hard one i, I mean I, like i said i'm i'm very lucky with my team i've got a great budget i think i'm probably the one <laughs> the, the worst one but um you know what had i have a if i had a, a if i was in a corporation and i was leading a much larger team how do you manage all these well, different emotions because you don't oh, know so what people are thing. going through we're making an assumption when we say emotional management it has to be perfect yeah. It doesn't have to be perfect. It's just understanding. Again, if when you live by your values, we allow ourselves to make mistakes could be a value. Okay. It's how quickly can you just overcome that? 
there's no such thing as perfection. Emotional management is about be, becoming aware of what's happening on the inside. Mm. Again, duality. You never, as the second we stop thinking that we have to be the perfect human being, but truly, the second we start to accept that it's okay to make mistakes, it's okay to be hot headed, it's okay to be this, it's okay to be that, the second you accept it, then you go into a mode of, well, how do I become aware of it and then rectify it so that when I'm in my up, because this is life, the ups and downs, the peaks mm. and troughs, so it feels like when I'm down in my trough, I can come back very, very quickly to the peak. Mm. So it's not am I going to fall. Because you are going to fall. That's how quickly. It's just how quickly. Now the masters, and I'm not a master, have, have mastered this. It's not that they don't fall. It's just that they, it feels like they're constantly at the peak of the mountain because as soon as they fall, they recognise it and bring themselves back up again. How do you bring yourself back up again really? By awareness. Awareness and questions. Awareness and, and, and knowing, questions. And again, going below the below surface. Below the surface, Look, yeah. behaviour, just be aware of the behaviour and then ask yourself where is this coming from? It goes beyond insights of behaviour. Okay, so going back to toxic people and toxic people in the work environment. So I can be aware of myself and how that, but say I'm working with someone that's really toxic, manipulate all those things that you mentioned before, manipulative, you know, doing things the wrong way, aggressive, passive aggressive, all those things. What do I do in that situation? I, I'm, I'm aware of myself. I'm also aware that that person is doing this at a place of fear, you know, I don't want to confront them because they're a bit too aggressive for me or they're a bit too domineering for me. I don't, my boss, it's the biggest salesperson, so he's not going to be on my side. What do we do in yeah, that situation? I mean, that's a good question, yeah. Like, you know, like there are some It's not always in your control. It's no, not absolutely. always in control and there's nothing you can do. You understand all of that and it's all really, really great, but you, you also, you're all kind of in a, in, in, in a position where you're, you're feeling a bit cornered. Like my instant response to that is, you know, how quickly can I remove myself away from this person or how quickly – I had I had a friend that was actually uh, in a very similar situation or probably exactly the same situation and she ended up kind of completely removing herself from – Yeah, it depends the, the, It depends on how far it is. It depends on where you are in the pecking order. Yeah, It depends yeah. on how much influence they have. There's a whole bunch of things there. But there's two things that you have to recognise. Number one, how is it making me feel? Yeah. And understand that no one can make you feel negative about yourself unless you allow them to. Mm -hmm. So you've got to you've got to understand that this is not about you; it's about them. Yeah, that's yeah. number one. Number two, how do I limit if I can't change any of it? And I've spoken to the boss, and nothing's changed. How do I limit my interaction with them? Yeah. Now, if it gets really, really, really bad, how do I remove myself? And you can't control it. We've got choices. It's just a workplace. Yeah. How do I remove myself completely from them? Yeah. Now, it de again, it depends on where it is in the pecking order. So, for example, what if it's the boss? All right, what if it's the boss? And then you have to say, and, and there's a number of, when I coach people, it's always around, look, within your life, you're going to have some amazing bosses, a small percentage of incredible bosses, a large percentage of good bosses, and a small percentage of really bad bosses. But they all teach you something. Mm -hmm. So be grateful for all of them. When you've got that best boss in the world, just enjoy it, mm -hmm. learn as much as possible and take as much opportunity from it as possible. Mm -hmm. Because it's going to change. You're never going to have just the one boss. The chances are. Yeah, yeah, of course. Then the ones who are good bosses, but they've got their faults, work with it. Just understand them. It's a bit of give and take and you have to manage upwards. The really, really bad ones, well, it's teaching you what not to be, but you've got two choices. You can either leave or you can just outlive them. The chances are if you're in a place long enough, you're going to outlive them anyway. It's up to you what you choose and how bad it gets. You know, there's a, there's a, a research that has shown that 75% of people usually leave the workplace for another job, not for money, but because of who their boss is. Really? Yeah. Wow. So that's where we have to look at leadership. Leadership's and a big one, especially the today. The training of leadership leaders yeah. and the self-awareness with leadership and things like that. Now, what if you're the leader who's toxic? That's another situation. Yeah. Right, so that you can become aware, again, become aware of it. The best thing you can do with toxicity in the workplace is 
recognize it very quickly, address it very quickly, okay, and give people the opportunity to rectify their behavior. Just give, but early on in the stage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I must admit, I've yeah, I've I've made the mistake of letting things go for too long. We, we do so encouraging. There's two things that successful organisations need. In the hopes, in the hopes, and this is being critical to myself right now. I've allowed things to go on for too long that I knew weren't that great, you know, um, and other people had made it clear to me that this is not this is not good. But uh, I my emotions got in the way of things, and trying to kind of see you know, that person's perspective as to why they're doing what they're doing and what have you, which ended up just being this long drawn out process that ended up being, um, you know, a parting of ways anyway. Yeah, but you've learned from it. That's yeah, number one. Yeah, no, you've no, I 100% it. learned from it. But, but you can reflect on it as well. Yeah, the yeah, mo- yeah, The most successful companies understand two things, right? We need to be able to encourage constructive conflict in the workplace and have coaching. Those organisations that don't allow for constructive conflict, so we're scared of having the conversations, the honest conversations, and don't have coaching, well, that's why they just they just sort of ignore certain behaviours, hoping that it will go away, but we know that it'll just get worse and worse and worse, and eventually it will lead to either a person is fired or they leave, eventually. Mm. Yeah, but yeah. why go through all that headache and angst and turmoil when you could have hit it directly and just by one conversation, which is an open, honest conversation, a tough conversation, mm. without fear, from a place of love, Mm, mm, mm. and then introduce the coaching mechanism. Mm. It's interesting. Two things, that's it. Yeah.